be crushed. You killed him with one blow. Hey everyone, Sean here. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, John Carter came out this weekend. And I've been looking forward to this ever since I saw The Asylum's Princess of Mars. And I think I've already made my feelings about that movie abundantly clear. It sucked. It really did. And I know part of that is due to the low budget that The Asylum usually has, but even with the limited resources they had, if they just had some competent writing, they could have made a much better movie. You know, low budget doesn't excuse a piss poor screenwriting. You just, you put some effort into it or you don't, and they didn't. Um, and unfortunately, the Disney version kind of suffers from the same problem. I mean, obviously they do have a bigger budget. They can throw a ton of money at it, which they did, but still, it could have been better. It really could have. It almost has the same problem. It's just the mediocre writing really hampers it in some cases. And that's not to say it's a bad movie. It's not. It, it's, it's a decent science fiction movie. It makes for a good summer blockbuster, even though it's not actually summer, but that's kind of what this movie feels like. But, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, I noticed that on Rotten Tomatoes right now, it has a rating of, uh, I think, 49%. So critics have been very divided over this so far, and I can see why, because there's a lot to like and there's a lot to hate. Um, and a lot of what there is to hate mainly comes from the writing. Um, I mean, visually, I don't have many complaints. They did a very good job of designing the planet of Mars, or Barsoom as the locals call it. Um, I like the design of the alien races, uh, the look of the planet itself, the design of the ships. Um, I thought it all looked pretty good. Um, but yeah, the story... The story has troubles pretty much right from the beginning. Um, as soon as the movie starts, you get a little bit of a prologue with a narrator just briefly describing Mars. And then you get a quick battle between two different factions of people with really no explanation who the hell they are. And you're introduced to your two villains. We have Saab Thon, who is the leader of the Martian city of Zodanga, and uh, Matai Shang, who is the leader of a group of people called the Therns. And really all it does is let you know they exist. The first thing I thought of after I saw that prologue and then the title flashed across the screen was like, well, that happened. I am completely lost, and I read the book. <laughs> now, now, part of it is that uh, this is partially based on Princess of Mars, but it also has some elements from the second and third books in the series, which I haven't read yet. I've only read summaries of them, so that, that could explain part of my confusion. Um, if you haven't read any of the books, you're going to be completely lost after that prologue. So, really... I would say if you go see this movie, just ignore the first few minutes and just tune out until you see the title John Carter flash across the screen. Then you can start paying attention. You won't miss anything. You really won't. In fact, it'll probably save you some confusion. Basically, to give you a quick rundown of the plot, John Carter is a former Confederate soldier who is out uh, hunting for gold in Arizona. And at some point, he is attacked by a group of Apaches and takes refuge in a cave and... While he's in a cave, he actually meets one of the therns that I mentioned just a minute ago and ends up uh, stealing his little magical wibbly-wobbly timey-wimey teleportation device and suddenly finds himself on Mars. And uh, the, the way they handled his arrival on Mars I thought was actually very well done, uh, much better than the Asylum. Because uh, in the Asylum's version, when John Carter arrives on Mars, he just instantly discovers he's not very affected by Mars gravity, but has no trouble with it whatsoever. He's like, oh, nice. I can jump really high in the air. Sweet! The way that this movie handles it is much more realistic. He Basically, he tries to take a step and immediately just gets thrown off by the low gravity and does a face plant. And the next couple of minutes are just him basically tumbling over and over again, trying to get used to it. Uh, 
was a it was pretty funny to watch, but also made it feel much more real because it makes sense that it would take a while to get used to that. Um, yeah, and then after stumbling around for a minute and eventually getting the hang of moving around on the planet, he runs into an alien race uh, called the Tharks, which are basically these, I think they're like 12 feet tall and they have four arms, uh, green skin with tusks, uh, the leader of whom is called Tars Tarkas, who is voiced by Willem Dafoe. And I don't know how this man manages to steal the entire movie despite never appearing on camera. But I guess Willem Dafoe is just that good. That's, that's what he does in pretty much every movie he's in. He's, that, that's just what Willem Dafoe does. He's that good. And uh, they end up taking John Carter captive. And th this is one part of the movie that really pissed me off. Because you know, at this point, the story pretty much follows the same path that the Asylum took. Apart from... Uh, the extra characters that they threw in there just for the sake of it. Um, when they bring him back to the Thark City, they do the same goddamn thing the Asylum did. They use a fucking babblefish ripoff so he can suddenly communicate with them. Uh, but instead of feeding him a bug, they just give him some kind of liquid. It's like, here, drink this. Now you can understand us. Neat. It's like, no. No, that's not neat. That's lazy. Stop ripping off Hitchhiker's Guide. I like Hitchhiker's Guide, too. But it's a comedy. It's not supposed to be taken serious. If you're making a serious sci-fi movie and you're stealing themes from a comedy, you are doing it wrong. Stop it. And over time, John Carter eventually meets uh, Deja Thoris, who is the princess of the city of Helium, one of the factions of red men on the planet of Mars. And the, the red men are basically the same as humans, just with darker skin. And... Uh, the other city that they're, that Helium is at war with is Zodanga, which is led by the aforementioned Sab Than, who is being manipulated by the Therns and Matai Shang. And eventually he becomes entangled with the war and falls in love with Deja Thoris and, of course, ends up marrying her after knowing her for all of 72 hours because it's a Disney movie. What can you do? It's, uh, again, the Asylum did the exact same goddamn thing, but... Yeah, that's... It's Disney. What can you do? And I'm not going to give away much more of the story because I don't want to get into heavy spoilers here. But, uh... Yeah, some of the problems with the writing that I had as I look at my cheat sheet... Um... The Therns... Didn't really seem to have any motivation for doing what they were doing. I mean, they reveal in the movie that basically... Over thousands and thousands of years, they've been manipulating their way into the leadership of some planets, and then they wipe it clean of all life, suck it dry, and then move on to the next planet and rinse and repeat. And they do this because... Plot. I don't know. There's even a point when John Carter asks... Uh, Matai Shang, like, what cause do you have for this? He says, we have no cause. We're just doing it because we can. Lazy. Um, and there's another thing about the Therns. They have mastered what they call the Ninth Ray of Light. They don't do a very good job of explaining what this is, and they never bother at all to explain what the other eight rays are. Now, if you've read the book, then you know what they're talking about, um, at least to some extent. The, the movie changes it up a little bit. But if you have not read the book, you're going to be completely lost there because they never bothered to explain a damn thing. Um, if you haven't read the book, basically the first seven rays of light are the colors of the rainbow. And those are the only rays of light that, are, that exist on Earth. The eighth ray is basically a propulsion ray only exists on Mars, and it's what allows their ships to fly. And they, they say in the movie, their ships float on the light. And they also kind of hint at this when they say, like, during night, when all you the only light you have out is the moon, the ships can't fly as high. They have to go nearer to the ground because there's not enough light to propel them. So they kind of hint at it, and they sort of explain it, but it's not done very well. 
And if you don't already know what you're getting into, it's, it's not going to make much sense. And the ninth ray is apparently uh, some sort of magical death ray or physical weapon or whatever the hell you want it to be, basically. It's, it's the form whatever the hell you want ray. And yeah, part of the plot is that Deja Thoris is on the verge of discovering how to use the ninth ray, and the Therns are trying to put a stop to that because they don't want anyone else to know their secrets. So that part of their motivation actually made sense. The part about just taking over the world and putting Sabthan in power was just because they could. So, uh, what else? It just really seemed like they came up with an idea for a cool villain with mystical powers, but then didn't know what to do with him. Didn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, what else? What else? Well, the way they handled some of the characters was a bit off. Um, I did like what they did with Sola. Um, Sola is a, a female Thark who uh, ends up becoming a close ally of John Carter and Dejah Thoris. And she was in the Asylum's version of the movie. I never mentioned her in my review because there was no reason to. She didn't do anything. She, she, she was just there to fill up the screen, basically. She was only in, probably only had about five minutes of screen time. Um, in this movie, she actually does stuff. She's actually an important character. Thank you. Thank you, writers, for doing that correctly. Um, unfortunately, some of the other characters, like uh, Kantos Khan, for example, he is handled better in this movie. Um, he does more than just recite a stupid poem and then die. <laughs> really should have done more with him, because if you read the book, you know he's a much more valuable character. He basically becomes John Carter's best friend. And here he doesn't really do anything. Uh, Sarkoja, one of the Tharks, she's basically playing the role of the bitch. She is there to be angry, and that's really all she does. Again, in the book, had a lot more to do. In the movie, not so much. You could have taken her out of the movie and it wouldn't have changed a thing. Uh, but yeah, at least they included her in the movie. I will give them that. That's more than the Asylum did. 